você acha que o lado escuro da mídia é só o que não aparece ou é algo ruim? Os dois. Acho que é os dois. Ah, pode ter duplo sentido. Bom, é, é difícil até de falar por não ter muito contato com isso, mas... É... Eu acho que ambos, porque o lado ruim às vezes atinge um só interesse e o que não aparece deveria ser divulgado. Eu acho que o lado escuro da mídia é a parte que eles escondem, na verdade. É o que eles deixam de mostrar por questão de interesse mesmo, governamental, das empresas. Então, acho que o lado escuro da mídia, na verdade, é, é só uma, uma coisa assim, que eles não, eles não, não que eles escondem, eles omitem outras, outras ocasiões para que a, não preocupar a sociedade como uma medida de proteção. É, droga. Você acha que o lado escuro da mídia, ele só é oculto ou ele é ruim? Eu acho que ele é ruim, uma vez que a gente não tem profundidade, ideia da profundidade das informações. Hum, é, e eu acho que as duas coisas em determinado momento distinto. Eu acho que hoje em dia muito mais o lado oculto, só que acho que tempos atrás o lado lado ruim também. Essa, essa concepção do, do lado negro da força, do, do próprio Star Wars. Do... Eu acho que para eles estarem omitindo isso daí, é obviamente porque tem alguma coisa de ruim envolvida no meio. Não sei se pode ter interesses ocultos de pessoas que têm mais poder é, e poder acabar afetando, de certo modo, até a economia. Voltamos com Linkados na Área com Richard Grusin, falando sobre The Dark Side of the Media and Deep Web. So Richard, as I said before, some ex-CIA agents revealed details of United States surveillance programs. This is one of the many sides of the Deep Web, right? How do you analyze it? I think that uh, the, well, there are a number of different ways that I th one could analyze what's been going on. I think it's important in some ways to recognize or to be clear about exactly what is being archived or what kind of surveillance is happening. Um, when you listen to the Obama administration's uh, spokesman talk about, on, they go on television and talk on the news show about what they've done, what the spokesmen say is, we are not listening to your phone calls. We are not reading your email. And they're very careful to say that, to say, Specifically, we're not listening in on your phone calls, we're not reading your email. And technically, actually, that's true. What they are doing is archiving those records, particularly the metadata, which is the information about where and when and who is logging on, who you're calling. And that's being saved in a computer. It's being run through complex data mining programs that are looking for patterns of behavior that could be seen as dangerous or suspicious, or they're just being held so that if at a certain moment uh, in time there's a security concern, for example, that the government has, they can go back and then they can read your email and then they can listen to your phone. So one way to analyze what's been going on is that uh, while it's absolutely true and crucial to realize that the government has been doing this and that, uh, and that we as users need to be aware yeah. that they've been doing this. It's also the case that there's, they're literally not reading every message or listening to every phone call because there's just, there are millions, billions of, you know, of these happening really hourly. And so it would be impossible for them to do that. Yes. So that's uh, what makes it a kind of interesting Uh, situation. The dark side there is in the potential of taking this information that hasn't yet been read and using it to punish your enemies, to, uh, to do, uh, pursue people who you might have differences with, things like that. Um, people whose opinions disagree with yours, who challenge the government. That's where this can be turned into, I think, the kind of Darth Vader dark side. All right. So. And there are many views on the dark side of the media and deep web all over the world. Uh, do these concepts change from country to country or they're all the same anywhere? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I think that 
we recognize generally, I think we've learned over the past century or so, uh, that cultural values are different and that culture is in many respects relative, that what is seen to be um, positive in one culture might be negative in another culture. People behave differently. Um, in Brazil, uh, people talk with their hands, people are very emotional, there's a lot of touching. In the United States, people would be uncomfortable if you, someone you didn't know very well came up and gave you a kiss and a hug or, you know, patted. And so we know that culture is very different and has been different uh, for a long time. Now the internet is really an interesting example because the internet is transnational and transcultural. You can, you have people using it in, using the same programs, for example, um, in different ways. So my Facebook feed has many Brazilian friends. And it's interesting to see that on the one hand, Facebook makes all of these, um, makes all of these interactions the same. That is, whether you're in Brazil or in, uh, in Vietnam or in uh, the United States or wherever you might be in Germany, if you post a status update on Facebook, immediately you get a, con a comment box pops up and you have the opportunity to like or to share and so forth. And this happens across culture. On the other hand, the content of what people put in might vary. So McLuhan said the medium is the message, and insofar as the medium is the message, then I think you do have a kind of more universal use of these media, of whether it's the dark, dark side, the deep web, or just the kind of surface social media that we all use. So I think it's that both are at play, I think, in the structure of the media. They're fairly similar, but in the different ways people use the media, they can be different from culture to culture. Estamos no Linkados na área e já voltamos com Richard Gruzin.